Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mount Helena Community Church. So grateful that you are here on this Palm Sunday. It's the week before Easter when Jesus came riding on a donkey into Jerusalem as the coming king. Would you stand with us? We're going to worship and sing together. Uh, The folks out there, it's an unusual Sunday. They're out there sign up Sunday, hanging out. They'll get the hint. They'll come on and worship with us when they hear us, okay? My name is Jeff. I'm an elder here at Mount Helena Community Church. This is Leah, Lisa, Nick on the bass, and James hiding behind his little glass cage. It's actually plexiglass, but... I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me All of my days I've been held in your hand 
that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God. Let's sing that again. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All of my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am in Oh, I will sing of the good is running after us, Lord. Lord, thank you for your sacrifice that you gave your only son, Jesus, to die for our sin, to defeat death, and to raise, be raised again that we would have eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Amen. These next two songs are going to fit in with 
the theme of today. It is Palm Sunday. From John chapter 12, verse starting in verse 9. Excuse me, verse 12. The next day, a large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. And so they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yes, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your, the king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. The king has arrived. Yeah. He is here. Not only did he arrive in Jerusalem, but he arrived. He has arrived here today with his spirit inside of us, living and active, and we sing praises to him. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes, to reveal the prayer and prophets, to a virgin came the word. From a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Where is your sin? 
Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. Yes, Lord. Good morning, Mount Helena Community Church. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. If you are a guest with us this morning, I just want to welcome you and thank you for joining us this morning. My name is J.R. Quigley. I'm a senior leader here at Mount Helena, and I'll be sharing the message with you today. 
you did come on a good Sunday to visit because we have our sign-up Sunday going on. And what that means is that all of our small group leaders are at tables out there, and they're wanting to visit with you about possibly joining their group. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to grab one of those menus you see out there or kind of browse the tables and see what kind of groups are there, see if there's something that you might be interested in participating in and uh, sign up for that. So it's a great day for you to be joining us. Uh, we do also have a welcome packet for you out there at the Welcome Center where that counter is out there. And you can grab one of those when you're there. We'd, we'd love to uh, put one of those in your hands so you can get to know us a little better. Uh, I got a couple other announcements for you today. Um, what's that big holiday next week? Do you know that Easter, we have years and years of data over the years, and far and away, the busiest, most attended Sunday is Easter Sunday. Not just in our church, but in churches all over the world. It's by far, more than Christmas, by a long shot, because really the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what our faith is centered around. It's an important time for us to recognize what he did and the value of of what he did at the cross and then in his own resurrection. So uh, I would encourage you to attend next week. It's going to get busy in here. Uh, If you like coffee and you like pastries, anybody? Come on. Come on. Who's with me? Uh, We're going to have some goodies available next week. So you might want to come as early as 930 next week for some time of um, just enjoying some of the food and coffee and those kind of things um, uh, before our service starts starts at the normal 10 Um, o'clock. You'll notice right in here, like, I don't know if I scare people, but there's always a little gap right here in the middle where nobody sits. I'm not insecure about it or anything, but if you'd like to be like teacher's pet, you could come sit in the middle. Really what we have to think about next week is, you know, it's not been unusual for us to exceed 400 people in here at Easter, and so what that means is you've got to scooch in, and I know Montanans like their space. I mean, there ought to be a chair between every one of you if you really were to confess what you wanted, right? But what we're going to have to do next week is we're going to have to keep in mind to cram in. I mean, I, I'm willing to, like, you know, give you cookies or something. I think I promised that last time. If you'll sit up here in the front and squeeze in a little bit uh, so that we can make room for guests. Here's the thing. A lot of people, they, they only go to church once or twice a year. And it's one of the few times that they'll hear the gospel, where they're going to hear some scripture, where they're going to have an opportunity to see community and action and those kind of things. And, and we want to give them a great experience. And we, we really want... Uh, to give God opportunity to capture hearts so people will enter a deeper level of commitment with him and further their walk with him. So anyway, that's happening next week. We also have, I don't know if you've seen these, but a little while ago, uh, Nick, our um, tech genius, made us these invitation cards. And it's just, a, I'll save you the seat. It's an invitation card for those. Uh, this is a great opportunity to invite people to church. You should be inviting people to church. Inviting people to participate in worship, to be in the presence of God, to meet some of your friends, and to possibly be, you know, when the Word of God, when we stand up here and we read the Scripture, it goes out into people's hearts and minds, and it does a work inside of us. That's what the Word of God does. It's alive. It's active. It sets out to accomplish something inside of us. And when people have the opportunity to hear from the Scripture, it begins to stir faith. That's where faith comes from. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And so we want to give people that opportunity. Invite people to church. Anyway, if you want to put these cards to use, if you're one of those those types that would use this, they're at our uh, giving stations around here, and there's some in the office as well. There's a QR code on the back that people can scan and let us know that they're coming and invites them to join us on a Sunday. How many of you know that people are welcome to come to church? Okay, you don't have to sign a release form. You don't have to sign in blood to walk through the door. It's an opportunity for people to hear the gospel and meet God's people. And so we want to be inviting people to church uh, so that they can be impacted by his word. You ready for some more Easter people? I've really enjoyed this series. I've enjoyed just reading about, pondering, and and considering the lives of those that were right around Jesus at the time of his death and resurrection. And we've looked at Thomas, we've looked at um, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Of course, uh, Clem shared a good message with us last week. He tried to steal some of my thunder for this week, so... I had to re-engineer that a little bit, but I'm just, I'm really glad. Would you, I just, something that struck me during worship this morning 
And man, we're singing those joyful, declarative words. And I realize that for some of you, those words are not your reality. Hell lost another one, I am free. I don't feel very free. Death, where is your sting? Hell, where is your victory? Wow, I feel those things. Death does sting. I felt it. How do we sing these things? It's, we understand that God has done something bigger than our circumstances, that our eternal destination and our eternal freedom are secured in Christ, even though we suffer in this life. And I want to take a moment here and just pray for you. If you were singing those songs with us and just kind of going, I don't know that I can really mean this. I want to pray for you right now. Lord, we come before you this morning. Just humble ourselves. Say, Lord, we, we sing these, these big songs and we want to be joyful and full of faith. And, and God, I just pray for those who struggled this morning with those words. Those who feel the sting of death. We know it's painful, it's real. Lord, those that are struggling with addictions, who don't feel freedom or freedom from their sin or freedom from their past. God, I pray that you would, your word says you liberate the captives. You you cause the prisoners to prosper. (laughs) Lord, I pray that you would be doing a work in those hearts who have just said to you, that was me, I'm struggling. Lord, I pray you meet them in this moment as we go through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk about somebody who probably, other than Jesus himself, is probably the most significant character in the Gospels. We know a lot about him. We don't know a lot about all the disciples, but we know a lot about Peter. Peter got himself in the book quite a bit, didn't he? He, he's, he is a character, and we can see that based on his behavior, and I'm just going to Uh, go through four short stories about Peter today. And I want you to to engage your imagination to be thinking, if I were in Peter's shoes, what did this look like? What did Peter feel? What did he see? How did he respond? How would have I responded? What would I have thought in these circumstances? We learn a lot from Peter and can identify with him. I want to begin with a story that, you know, if you grew up in the church, it's a very familiar story. And it's the story of Jesus walking on the water, which is just mind-blowing in and of itself. I mean, I walk on the water when it's frozen to drill holes to try and catch fish. Not very well, I might add. But Jesus walked on the water. It's just one of the most uh, naturally defying things that he does. And in fact, the story is funny. The, the, The disciples are out there in the boat, and they're trying to get across the sea, and there's a storm and, and it actually describes Jesus walking on the water, and he's actually walking like he's going to walk right by him. Did you know that? Do you ever catch that in that story? I'm like, where was he, what was he going to do? It's, Hi, guys. How's it going? I'll see you on the other side. I, thought, I find that so funny. I'd like to know what he was thinking. I wonder if, did Jesus chuckle to himself? He had to have sometimes. He was a man of sorrows, I know, but he had to chuckle, and that had to be one of those moments. The disciples are freaking out. And in the Gospel of Matthew, it records Peter's engagement with Jesus in this moment. In chapter 14, beginning in verse 28, it says, And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water And came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took a hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. How many of you are not fans of big, deep water? Wow, there's a lot more of you like me than I thought. Listen, I can swim, and I will if I fall out of the boat, but that's about it, if I have to. I don't care for the big, deep water. 
Now, when I consider what's going through Peter's mind when he sees Jesus walking on the water, he's like, invite me out. Would you do that? What do I learn about Peter? This guy was up for an adventure. Of all the things you could do in that moment, Peter wanted to walk on the water with Jesus. He was courageous, maybe a little reckless. I don't know about you, but I'd have been with the other 11, safely in the boat, or not so safe. It it would just blow your mind. But I learned something about Peter. Consider his personality. Peter had personality. And I've been mentioning this as a part of these messages, and whenever we read the Bible, we have to remember these are not mythological ancient stories. These are real people with real lives who really did these things. They really walked and talked with Jesus, just like you would. And he really made the decision in that moment, Lord, invite me out there. I'm not going to get out on my own, but if you invite me, I'm coming out there. He wanted to join Jesus in that. See, Peter had a, a gumption about him. He was willing to take the risk. I don't know that I'd be willing to take that risk, to step out there on the waves and do something that humans don't really do, walk on water. He took a risk. We all take risks sometimes. There's a lot of lessons we can learn from this short story, but I mean, we see that Peter gets out there, he walked on the water, and he got to Jesus, and then he freaked out. He began to doubt, even though he'd started the journey. And here, you and I begin to see ourselves, I think. Have you ever taken a risk believing God called you to something? If God has challenged you and spoken something to you, and you want to take the risk to do that, or be that, or go that direction, whatever it is, could be very, very small, could be huge. Something as wild as stepping out onto the sea. But sometimes we take risks and we think, God's called me to something I'm going to start going, and boy, you have all the faith and the energy, but then you get out in the middle of it, and the storm rages around you, and you panic. Maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I'm making the wrong choices here. Maybe, I didn't, maybe Jesus didn't really tell me to come. Maybe I'm not really meant to do this. I begin to doubt. Such an important lesson for you and I to begin to learn. When, we, when Jesus has called us to something, no matter what it is, even if it's walking on the water, you can do it. Whatever he calls you to do, you can do it. There's something here, too, that we also have to be concerned about and maybe take a lesson from Peter in a good way. Is You know what Peter did? He didn't just assert himself to walk on the water. He asked Jesus. Lord, you need to invite me. If I'm going to do this, you're going to have to speak to me. I'm not going to self-will myself out on the water. Here's a major secular message in society. You can be whatever you want. I'm sorry, that's a lie. Sorry. But you can be whatever Jesus has called you to. You have to listen for his voice. You have to seek him for life and your direction in life for the things you're going to do, the decisions you're going to make. You are not God. He is. And so when we're going to take a risk, it's wise for us to say, Lord, if you tell me to, I will. If you call me to it, I'll take the steps towards you. Peter did that. He was wise in doing so. We also would be wise because we live in a a culture that tells us you can do it. Be whatever you want to be. You are master of your own destiny. And certain elements of that might be true. But it's foolishness to step out and risk to try and walk on the water where Jesus hasn't called you. But Jesus did call Peter, and he took those steps. But he began to doubt. And he began to sink. Just for fun, I wonder, when he was sinking, how fast was he sinking? You ever think about that? I mean, like, If I went to go walk on the water and just instantly stopped, I'd be like half a second, I'd be under the water, right? Or did he just kind of slowly sink? 
I'm sinking. Help me. That's way more than you wanted to hear. <laughs> the deep thoughts of JR. All right. The other thing I notice in this story surrounding Peter is what do the disciples say? Jesus, he walks on the water. Peter walks on the water. Peter starts to sink. Jesus saves him. They get in the boat. The storm dies down. And what do they say? Truly you are the son of God. They knew who he was. They just witnessed the most amazing thing. They confessed who he was. Do you confess who he is? The Bible teaches us that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, then you will be saved. So we come to this point where we go, he is the Lord. That is the truth. That is the reality. He is the Son of God. And that's how we know faith is rising in us. Their faith grew tremendously witnessing this moment. I want to move on to another story about Peter. And it's Peter in the garden, and it's a challenging story. It's just been the Last Supper. It's night. And I'm going to read from John's Gospel, chapter 18 in this case. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, then let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into his sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that my father has given me? You know, all the gospels record this story in different ways. And there's other details we glean when we look at the other gospels. In fact, you know, Jesus says, according to Matthew, Jesus said, I could call... Well, put your sword away. I could call 12 legions of angels right now. You know, I, how many is in a legion? Anywhere from like 3,000 to 6,000 times 12. I'm not a math guy. What is that? 72, possibly up to 72,000 angels, 36,000 angels. Are my school teachers checking me and making sure I'm okay? I think it just means a lot. I could call 12 legions of angels, Peter, if that's what I wanted to happen. We also know that in other Gospels, it records that Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Like, what is that? Why did he do that? There's a lot of speculation about why this was the case. But you have to remember something about these days. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have a local newspaper They didn't have photos. Jesus was famous, but, you know, maybe people saw him from a distance in a crowd, walking by. Many of these guys may have never seen the man or known what he looked like. You wouldn't know. You know what every celebrity looks like now, right? Every famous person. I kind of get sick of looking at him, to be honest with you. There was no way for this many people in the city of Jerusalem and area to all know what Jesus looked like. It was highly unlikely that that was possible. So most, I think the most reasonable explanation is that this was going to be Judas definitely saying, this is the man you need to arrest. This is the man they want. Some of them probably knew. But because Judas was so close to him and Judas knew they would be in the garden, he betrays Jesus with a kiss. 
Last week, Clem brought up the idea, you know, the, this whole band of people. I think Clem said something like he figured around 500. I don't know how many. A lot. With their weapons and their torches and their lanterns. Who are you looking for? We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. They all fall down. Who was really in control in the garden? Had Jesus lost control? Was God's plan being foiled? Oh, God didn't want his son to be arrested. and Yeah, that's part of the plan. God was in control even in the garden. In fact, you know, Jesus could have called those legions of angels just, just before this when he's praying and he's sweating those drops of blood. It says, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus was submitted even unto death. Peter, on the other hand, see, we've talk, we talk about this sometimes, but we need to remind ourselves that the disciples, first of all, we're in an era where the Holy Spirit has not yet come in power to the earth. Don't have time to unpack that, but we're going we're gonna to be going through the book of Acts this summer. You have to realize that with the changing of the covenant, the world changed. It's just like the flood with Noah. The whole world changed with Jesus' death and the coming of the Holy Spirit. I think we maybe underestimate the impact that had on creation. Because we look at these guys sometimes and we feel like they might be a little dense. Why, why aren't they getting these lessons? Why aren't they realizing these things Jesus is saying to them? Because they don't yet have the power of the Holy Spirit at work in their lives like you and I do today. I don't think we can underestimate that. But see, these guys, Peter knows that Jesus is a king. And he knows that he's a savior. He understands this about Jesus, but he fails to understand how this is actually going to happen. He hasn't yet understood. He They argue even who's going to be the greatest in Jesus' kingdom. They're expecting to overthrow Rome, to cast off the tyrant, and they're expecting to set up their own Jesus government, and Jesus will be the king. He will be the the son of David that liberates the Jews. That is so much of what they're thinking. And Peter has a sword. Here is the moment Here is the moment that the rebellion breaks out. They're going to come arrest him. They're going to try him. Not on my watch, Peter says. See, how does Peter respond? Peter has knowledge, but he doesn't have wisdom. He has the information, but he's misusing it. He's not wielding the information he has correctly. He draws his sword, and with amazing precision or not, slices off the ear. You know how much that probably hurt? And did it hit his shoulder too, I wonder? Had to have. Unless he just kind of swung it weakly and just chopped it in half this direction. And I've obviously been thinking about this all week. (laughs) What a terrible aim. Swinging for his head, probably. (laughs) and slices off his ear. I think it's really important that you and I consider, you know, we talk, I I do mention this a lot because I think it's so important. We're always looking for some new knowledge that's suddenly going to change our world and our lives. Boy, if JR would just preach this kind of a message, if I could just discover that one, we're always looking for this little bit of information that's just going to make it all different. It's not knowledge that makes the difference. Knowledge is important. But if we do nothing, If we do not obey with that knowledge, if we do not put that knowledge into practice in our lives, then it's just knowledge. It's not wisdom. It's just information. You don't need more information. We live in the information age. You guys know more about the Bible than most humans that have ever existed. We have plenty of information. What we need is wisdom. We need to take that knowledge that God has given us and use it in a correct way. Jesus knows that he, how he's going to become king. He knows how he's going to become authoritative. Peter does not. What does Jesus do? Put your sword into its sheath. Why? Shall I not drink the cup? What does that mean? He's, he's about to suffer for the sake of mankind. And, and in fact, we suffer 
in this life. Jesus, is pro- Jesus doesn't promise us easy life. Things like joy and peace and grace, even in the middle of our trials and tribulations, which the Bible promises us. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, brothers, James says. We're to consider it joy when we face those trials. Because God's working something out in us and because of that assuredness, because of that faith and that grace for the things that we go through in life. Because we have that, that's why we have joy. That's why we have hope. That's why we can say, death, where is your sting? Not because it doesn't hurt while we're in this life, but we understand that its power is only temporal, not eternal. And it loses so much sting in that case. Peter just didn't understand how it was going to happen, so he took matters into his own hands. Very, very interesting here. When should we take matters and help in our own hands and help God out a little bit? When should we take matters into our own hands to help Jesus out a little bit? We're about as good with that sword as Peter is, and we kind of just make a mess. I want to read to you a passage of Scripture out of Romans chapter 12. Repay no one evil for evil. Who? No one. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. How often should you avenge yourself? Never. But leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what Jesus did. He actually healed Malchus's ear. I don't know if he picked it up off the ground and put it on there and then pressed it to the side of his head and healed it. I've been thinking too long about this, haven't I? Or if he just put his hand up there and grew him a new one. Hopefully it matched the other one. Jesus repaid evil for good. He was being falsely accused. He was being arrested. Take up the sword. Hmm. I don't know. It's a tough subject. Let's move on. Peter's denial. I want to begin this story in Matthew chapter 26, 30, verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. They sang, just like we sang. It's okay to sing. In fact, the Bible teaches that God dances over you. And David danced with all his might. It's okay to dance. It's okay to sing. Then Jesus said to them, You will fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. They still didn't understand. Peter said, Though they all fall away. Here's Peter again. In his zeal. Rawr. Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And he was ready to die with him, wasn't he? Pulling out that sword, swinging it at the high priest's servant. And he was ready. And all the disciples said the same. Yeah, Jesus, we wouldn't deny you. We wouldn't, we're not going to scatter from you. We're not going to leave you. Peter was zealous. So you see, he was courageous, he was adventurous, he was a little reckless and foolish sometimes, but boy, he had zeal. But the story goes on, as we just read it in the garden, and Jesus gets arrested, and it continues out of Luke, saying this in chapter 22, then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed at a distance. In the Gospel of John, John also claims to be a part of it. And John also claims to have been a friend with the high priest and was actually able to go inside and witness what went on inside. And it's how we know it was through John. So John and Peter are kind of following at a distance. 
And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat, sat down together, one of the other gospels mentions that it was cold that night, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light, looked closely at him and said, this man was also with him. But he denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you are also one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour still, another insisted, saying, certainly this man was also with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. Okay, we have to think of the vernacular here. And, and today we'd be like, man, I don't know that guy. But he's like, man, I do not know this guy. I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And Luke is the only one who records this. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Have you seen some of that artwork that shows this moment? Some pretty interesting artwork out there about this moment. Jesus turns and looks at Peter. Ugh. And he went and he remembers how the Lord had said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. He did exactly what he said he would not do. Now, why did he do this? We're just coming out of the garden. He's like ready for a war. And Jesus is like, no, we're not doing this. How disillusioned was he in this moment? Wait, nothing happened the way I thought it was going to happen. Jesus just told us to stop. I'm not, and and he's fearing for his life. He doesn't want to be arrested. He doesn't want to be crucified. So he protects himself. He denies it. Denial of Christ is a big deal. I sometimes wonder, what, what was the look on Jesus' face? You know, that, just, that, 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 just that turn and look. What did he look like? I don't know. You ever feel like maybe Jesus is looking at you? I don't know. I sometimes... Uh, my dad has an amazing skill with his eyebrow. When I was a kid... Mom and dad, have you learned this skill? You raise the one eyebrow, and you, even if, if you look over the top of your glasses, it's especially effective. <laughs> Just what do you think you're doing? Sometimes I feel like God looks at me that way. What do you think you're doing? I've just screwed up. I've made a mistake. I've violated something in the kingdom of God. I've sinned. And all of a sudden, I feel an eyebrow from heaven. Oops. I think I don't mean to make light of Peter's situation. I'm sure it was a very somber thing. But I think you and I can identify with this. We know what it's like to be weak. We know what it's like to make mistakes. We know what it's like to not be who we thought we were. And then Jesus looks at us and we're like, Have you ever wept bitterly? Have you ever tasted a bitterness? that made you weep bitterly? I have. And I don't want to talk about it because it's bitter. It's awful. Maybe you can identify with Peter's sensation after realizing what he'd done. Jesus said these words, Luke 9, 23, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. And take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus has called us to a life not to deny him, but to deny ourselves. Peter was looking out for himself. How often do we look out for ourselves, protect ourselves? But the scripture calls us to deny ourselves. To no longer make ourselves the priority, but to submit ourselves in humility. Matthew chapter 10, 23, but whoever denies me before men, this is Jesus speaking, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. I don't know. This is one of the most powerful scriptures in the Bible. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. Denial of Christ is a big, big deal. And Peter has just done this. And I think if you and I are honest, we've probably done this ourselves in some way, shape, or form in our lives. And it's painful. Have you ever wept bitterly? 
That's what Peter's feeling. But I want to go on and wrap up with this. You know, we don't, we don't see Peter at the cross. I don't know where he went after he wept bitterly. He we, does pick up the story after the resurrection that he and John are the ones that run to the tomb that morning. So Peter's still there. He's still involved. He's connected. He's staying connected. He's screwed up, but he's staying connected. And Jesus now is resurrected, and Peter and Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, are talking. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Simon and Peter are the same guy, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved. We might quite feel the emotion of this situation just reading the text or understanding what was going on. But this cuts Peter to the heart. He's grieved that Jesus is having to ask him three times in a row whether or not he really loves him. Do you really love me? Yes. Do you really? Yes. Do you really? Ah. Yes, you know. You know all things. You know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. He said this, this he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. You know, this story with Peter begins in a boat. Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me. But then Peter denies. This is called the reinstatement of Peter. Peter's denial of Christ. He's rejecting Christ in a way. But Jesus is reinstating him to who he was called to be. You know, we know by the time John wrote his gospel, he was the last one to write it, quite a few years after everybody else. Peter must have already been dead because he knows how Peter dies. And he remembers Jesus' words. Because he said this. He was showing by what death Peter would glorify God. You know how Peter glorified God in his death? He also was crucified. But church history teaches that he was unwilling to be crucified in the same way Jesus was. He didn't consider himself worthy, so they turned the cross upside down. And he was crucified upside down, supposedly. John knew this when he pens this. Someday you will stretch out your hands and go where you do not want to go. What do we learn from Peter? Man, he, he's just like you and I. There was a part of him that was adventurous and courageous. There was a part of him that was zealous and wanted to do the right thing. Parts of him that were bitter at times. He grieved. Peter went on to be a force in the church. This man who denied Christ and in a way was kind of cut out a little bit is then brought back in and becomes one of the most recognizable Christians in history. He goes on to be a leader in the church and in other places. Some even say in Rome he went on to. Of course, eventually he paid with his life. He didn't deny Christ at the end, did he? He was crucified for it. What can you and I learn from that? I would suggest to you this morning to not underestimate how God can deliver you from your past or maybe even your present to become a force in his kingdom. Do not underestimate it. Look at what... Peter walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus. He loved Jesus. He swung a sword at a guy's head for Jesus. Not advisable. 
but he also denied Jesus, and he made mistakes. And do you know what Jesus did? He didn't reject him. Peter denied Jesus, but Jesus did not deny Peter. He kept Peter in. He brought him back in. He can bring you back in. When we celebrate next week, I hope that there's people, I hope this morning there's some people here hearing what I'm saying. You're never too far gone. Even if you would weep bitterly over your condition, your past or your present, you're never too far gone for God to turn your life around and use you in his kingdom. He did it with Peter. He did it with Peter. He can do it with you. Would you stand, please? It was not a bed of roses for Peter after that. Life was not easy as a Christian. It can be hard. But there is nothing more rewarding than following Christ. Nothing. Even if it results in death like it did for Peter, there still is nothing more rewarding for the human soul and spirit than to submit to our God and follow his way. Lord, thank you for Peter. Thank you for his life and stories. I wonder if he ever shakes his head in heaven and is embarrassed at himself that we all read about him all the time. I doubt it because it actually glorifies you, Lord. It draws attention to how loving you are, how compassionate you are, how powerful you are, and your desire to keep your sheep in the flock. Lord, I pray for every soul in this place, but especially those who are struggling with you, not, not really believing that you love them, not really believing life can have meaning and purpose beyond a wrecked past or troubled circumstances today. Lord, you are right there, ready to forgive ready to transform. And I pray that our hearts would respond to your grace for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll have a prayer team up over here to my left. would love to pray with you today. And if God is tugging on your heart, don't walk out of here today. Come speak with me. Come pray, or pray with the prayer team. Invite somebody to church next week. Come early for snacks. We'll see you next week.